Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the report is due on June 1st. Um, and I think, I think things are proceeding fairly well on our end. Um, we've got, I think four or five tasks that have been circulated with like internally for edits, um, amongst the five of us who have been working on this a lot. Um, and I think we're on track for finishing up all of our experimental portions by the end of the month as well. Um, so I guess my first thoughts here are things are looking pretty promising so far, um, but we're still working on kind of just compiling everything together and synthesizing that all into one cohesive document. And Holly, um, are you, did you guys, have you guys discovered anything that you think is going to be uh, of interest or a red flag um, as we think about folks looking at a draft and reviewing a draft that you might want to give anyone a heads up about or things are like you expected them or I'm trying to remember what our last conversation was um, one of, yeah. one about of the some of the components. Oh, go ahead, Holly. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I think the biggest thing coming up for me is we were really, really hopeful that we'd be able to get up to like 10 to 15% biochar into our cement mixture. And it's not looking like that's really going to be reasonable for us. So it'll probably be a lower amount. But um, Thomas, if if you had something else to add, uh, you can go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we, we have Carrie Miller on the call here. She's the PhD student who is doing actually all the testing in the lab as she is from the sky or I don't know. Um, looks like you're up in the cloud. Um, maybe maybe Carrie can give us a very conservative, you know, um, assessment of where all the mechanical strength testing results are, you know, are at right now and what you're seeing in the lab with respect to using biochar as an aggregate for, for cement, you know, don't promise too much. But what are you seeing in the lab? Yeah, so like Holly said, um, the main reason we couldn't do the much higher percentages of biochar was um, I was talking to one of my contacts who like actually plugs the wells and he was emphasizing that having a correct viscosity for the mix is really important for actually like going out and plugging them and like once you get past like five percent um added in even with a lot of super plasticizer it's like super duper viscous not at all like the control so um i found that just mechanical strength wise a th like a three percent by mass added in biochar mix has been the best kind of in every test i've done um there's only been like one or two times the 3% mix has not outperformed a control mix. Um, and the, those few times that it hasn't outperformed a control mix has been like less of a solid conclusion and more of an inconclusive conclusion. So I've been finding that the 3% mix is generally really, really good. Yeah, so I think that was, you know, an element that we earlier didn't consider, right? The viscosity thing. We thought more, we thought more about and focused more on strength, you know, just the mechanical strengths, but the viscosity is it's a huge deal for people who plug wells. And so I thought that was a, a discovery that was worth um sharing. But I also think um the fact that it seemed like the mechanical strength is increased with three percent biochar is super cool right i mean hey it's only three percent but if the strength is better maybe the um, i mean i'm just saying potentially the implications could be lower failure rates right of these plot wells in the future and it is you know three percent um if you scale that up will still amount to quite a bit of biochar um so i think so i think you know uh, as we move forward to you know, start to consider, you know, a potential pilot scale experiment. Um, these considerations are something we need to really um, 
think hard about. And I think for for planning purposes, we need to have uh, we need to add some professionals on the team who who does well blocking, right? And we have some contacts so that they can inform us about the do's and don'ts and what they're worried about. Um, so so anyways, I think that's and then the other thing was, you know, we talked about last time was brought up by Janice Hollowell, um, which really was focused on modeling, right? We talked, we talked a lot about last time about geomechanical modeling. And we came to the conclusion that, well, we're not doing modeling, but we are doing all the experiments. So we what you will see in the report, obviously if you <laughs> Carrie is working every day in all these experiments, and I'm not sure we'll have every single result by the first of June, but we will have some preliminary data related to the to these mechanical strengths tests that will be included. And you know, throughout June, she will continue to and finish all these um these experiments that they will be done uh, over the summer so they can help inform about what we potentially will do and not do for a pilot. Can I ask a couple questions? Um, Carrie, can, what can we what... just real quick add Brooke in as a panelist and host so that she can talk if she wants to right now? She's just an intent uh, attendee right now. Let me see if I can figure that out. Yes. Yep. OK, thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm curious about kind of particle size that you ended up using and any other um, variables that you tested in the mix. Um, that's one question. And then did you happen to do at least a back of the envelope calculation on the carbon footprint impact of, of displacing 3% aggregate and putting in biochar? I have not done that calculation. I'm wondering if Holly has information yeah, on that um, one. So we're not displacing any aggregate. This is an addition, not a replacement. Mm -hmm. So in terms of variables, I did test different particle sizes. Um, the one I have, I'd have to look up. I can't remember the exact size of the particles. Um, I was finding with larger particles, they just tend to separate from the mix because the density is so low. Mm -hmm. um, I can find the exact particle size I ended up using um, if you want. I can tell you for sure it's definitely the smallest size is the best. Yeah. Um, as far as other variables, um, I experimented with different quantities of plasticizer to try to like get the um, viscosity to be like match the control like as best as I could. So I did try um, a mix with a 3% mix with no plasticizer. And I did try a 3% mix with the same viscosity as the control, but with no plasticizer and added water. Um, that one did not do well at all. That one fell <laughs> apart. Um, and did you, did you try pre-wetting or anything like that, the biochar? I did not try pre-wetting. That was something I was thinking about with the larger particle sizes. Um, We've most of our our tests like the variables haven't really been in the mixes themselves, but like what conditions the cured cement or the curing cement is subjected to. Mm -hmm. So we've tried um, placing the like not fully cured cylinders in produced water in concentrations of chloride um, versus sulfate um, under heat. I'm trying to remember some of the other ones I've tried. In just normal water. Yeah, most most of them have been looking at the incompletely cured cylinders, not really varying the um, mix. Yeah. Um, Holly, if it's of interest, I um, have a very, very simplistic calculator that we used when we were doing different mixes of biochar in plaster and drywall. Um, just to give you an idea, we actually found that all you needed was about 5% biochar to get to carbon neutral with high carbon biochars, but that when it was like rice husk biochar was double or more. So if you're interested, I'm happy to share that. Yeah, that would be really useful since, um, you know, we didn't want to do like a whole techno-economic analysis for like every single mixture that we were doing. Um, so it'd be nice to just have these rough estimates to include as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh wow! So five percent. That's, I mean, that's that's intriguing. Then you know, um, because if we can, if then three percent might be more significant than we think. Of you know, 
Yeah, well, I think the carbon footprint of, of concrete is higher it. than drywall, so it might not be. But I think it's going to be more significant than you might guess. That's what um, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but if you're using the smallest particle size, that's probably more energy intensive and all that stuff. So these are just really rough estimates. Yeah, yeah, as yeah, long yeah. as you know your carbon content and the biochar and all that stuff, it'll it'll just give you an indication. Yeah, because of the low density, I mean, when you look at these cement <laughs> blocks, it's a lot of biochar. Even though it's only 3%, it's a lot of biochar because the density is so low, right? I mean, you're hauling in biochar. <laughs> so even 3% sounds like nothing, but it's a lot, you know, by volume. Interesting. So I actually did try a 5% mix. That was one of the ones where I was able to get it to flow, but I wasn't able to get it to be as liquidy as the control, but that one also did not fare very well, <laughs> compressive strength wise, unfortunately. I think 3% is pretty much in line with the research I've seen. So okay. that doesn't surprise me. Okay, that's good. That's good to know. Um... And of course, that combined with what we are hoping to store in between the cement blocks, right? Then, then, then the numbers will start to add up. Um, so, so Carrie, do you want to summarize some of the ongoing experiments, or have you more or less summarized everything that is ongoing and and will be finished this summer? Or no? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, mainly what I'm waiting for right now is um, based on recommendations I got. Um, the longest time point we're looking at is like after 28 days post curing. So mainly right now, I'm just waiting for a, a bunch of my experiments to reach 28 days so I can collect the final time point. Those should all be done by June 1st. The main thing that I think I would like, I, I probably won't have time to do is retest the, the heat curing study. Um, I, I think I made a mistake or my experimental setup wasn't the best and um, my samples were allowed to be dehydrated which is not ideal so that one I'll need to repeat and that probably won't be done by June 1st but the ion sorption um, for both chloride and sulfate the produced water immersion the normal water immersion um, just like the normal compressive strength with the different percentages of biochar and then as well as like my biochar characterization should all be done by June 1st. Great. Holly and Thomas, could I ask another question? I, I think um, part of the experiment or the research was looking at not just the additive to cement or concrete. Sorry, now you, you all are saying cement, but I thought we were dealing with concrete. So now I'm all mixed up again. Um, but I, I thought the discussion also, or the, the consideration was also um, as an ingredient for the spacer in between um, the plugs potentially. And I'm wondering what experimentation looks like for that piece. And if I'm remembering correctly, that this is maybe also one of the activities that we were gonna look at. So that's a consideration that we've had um, so far, just our conversations that we've had don't sound like there's really much to do experimentally on that. Um, I, I can't remember who it was. Someone suggested that for that portion um, during the pilot planning process, a project hazards analysis should be included for that, um, but that's not currently included in our experimental design, um, but it is intended to be like a front end of the pilot planning. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we need to consider, uh, as Holly correctly said, is, yeah, the risk, right? So when you suddenly put something of a different density than water in, and you have high pressure outside the well, or um, you have to calculate a model, you know, the, how much biochar you can put in without, you know, sacrificing the integrity of the well. Um, and as we have, we have done as a part of this assessment, I think we do have um, some numbers, right, based on literature studies, right, Holly? Uh, some numbers of, of what? 
I thought we, we, we found numbers where that indicated we could have up to about, was it Brooke who did that, you know, up to 10, 15 percent? Oh, yes, yes. There's typically about 15 percent like mud and like other materials inside of the well. And so our intention is to replace the like mud with the biochar. And then it seems like the water is really what keeps that pressure equalized. And so with the biochar hydrating, as long as the like water volume reaches where it's supposed to be, um, we're not really seeing many issues associated with replacing those materials so far. Yeah, so you, yeah, exactly. It's like, thank you. Uh, so you will see a summary of, of what is out there in the literature. Um, but of course, it might vary depending on pressure and temperatures. And so we need to, as we design a, a pilot, you know, get more accurate assessments that are relevant for that particular pilot that we potentially will, will be doing. And that, Jason and I had an opportunity to chat a little bit yesterday about pilot. I mean, I think at a certain point of time, we need to talk about, you know, what that would include, right? And what type of wells we potentially could use for testing uh, after we have designed the pilot. Um, we have a big new grant funded to CSU. Um, Dan Simoli got a big grant uh, related to methane uh, measurements. And um, Jason, do you have any details related to how we potentially could leverage um, this effort with the Dan Simoli's uh, plan? Because I think that could be very beneficial since yeah, they got a lot of funding and we can maybe leverage our part of funding with theirs in order to do something that's more significant. Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> the METEC facility is a world-class methane leak detection center, right? That's what they do. And so obviously there's synergisms with this, what we're talking about here, because, you know, it's really easy to detect kilograms per hour, but kind of the grams per hour, micrograms per hour, stuff like that. And those are all capabilities that they have out at the MeTech Center. And so for those of you that aren't aware, it is a Hollywood, Hollywood set for oil and gas um, is what it is, right? So they have a, anything you'd ever find on a wellhead, um, it, as well as the gathering and distribution. They have all of that infrastructure in there, and then they test sensors and different sensing apparatuses to understand the accuracy of those instruments. And so... You know, I, I was I was thinking big is we could have a fake well out there that we develop and then plug with infrastructure in it to where we can push methane through these things, you know, through the well at very specific locations uh, and do different simulations and stuff like that. That was kind of my big picture thought. That's what Thomas and I were discussing yesterday. But it can also just be as simple as we're going to use an existing well and go plug um, but integrate them from a sensing capability perspective. So we're not having to do that from the ground up. Um, in terms of credibility, <laughs> Dan's group were the ones that signed the, uh, so the European, Europe is basically anything that gets imported has a greenhouse gas metric on it. And this is a way that they're kind of using sticks as well as carrots in order to incentivize decarbonization. And so their group is defining the standards for the import of, of uh, compressed natural gas, basically LNG. Um, and so, you know, yeah, they're, they're the world experts. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Jason. And I've just put a link into MeTech at CSU. You can read more about it and the big team that is behind it. Um, so I think, I think that'd be a great opportunity. But anyways, that's probably beyond what we should talk about today. But I do want to put it on people's radar, especially, you know, the... Um, advisory board here um, since we, we we want to make sure that we we guide the development of a potential pilot granted that we move to a pilot right um, in the best possible way and that we take advantage of all the ongoing efforts such as such as this new, new whatever it was a 25 million dollar grant or something like that Jason, this is also a little off topic, but if there's ever the opportunity to test putting biochar around the pipelines that go to these wells or from these wells, um, and especially in the joints where methane sometimes 
you know, gets out, if there's a way to test putting layers of biochar around that and see if it is able to decrease methane. Um, I've spoken to a couple of oil and gas companies about doing that, but I don't think anybody's actually tested it yet. Yeah, so, I mean, what they do at the METEC facility is not only related to oil and gas, but also related to firefighter safety. And so they have test plots that they can basically put different soils in to understand how natural gas travels through the soils. And so this is really important for firefighters in terms of identifying leaks in homes, as an example, or outside homes. And so the METEC facility does have all of those capabilities. So if anybody is interested in things that you're talking about, that's something that, you know, they, the, the facility infrastructure is in place to do those sorts of tests. Mm, good to know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then, Thomas, there was a question from Janice about how the funding for this work that you're doing right now could potentially transition to a pilot. So I know that we've had so many conversations about the, the fiscal note. And so, <laughs> um, so I, I know the first part of the fiscal note and the and the funding related to this draft for this report, which would recommend whether or not there should be a pilot sunsets or um expires at the end of June. Yeah, but does there was then a, there's a second slice or tranche of funding yeah. from July 1st through the end of December. Yeah. And what is that funding eligible for? Like what would we could we or should we use it if if this group and the draft recommends that there should be a pilot, I, my my understanding or thought was that the second piece was um, setting up what the pilot should look like. That's exactly true. Um, so, so basically, yeah, the, the our money set aside already. I just talked to the CSU attorney, Ja um, Meeks, or what I think his name is, and he said, yeah, the the our money set aside and should come from the nat Department of Natural Resources. It is to basically help us design a pilot, and um, that design will start 1st of July and it's set to end by the end of the year. So it's pretty ambitious again, <laughs> um, but we're pretty excited about that based on the preliminary findings, especially because the funding is already in place and that the preliminary findings seems promising. But I do think that we as a team here, I'm teaming all of us here need to meet um, to talk about how to best design uh, a pilot. I mean, because it will include players beyond Jason's team and my team, because it becomes a lot more, there's a lot of practical um, considerations. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of information that is required that is beyond our expertise. Um, so what we will be working on, Jason and I, is assembling a team that can help design uh, an appropriate pilot study, but we also, I think as a group need to discuss how such pilot experiment, you know, would actually look like, you know, are we, are we so for example, could we use some of the um, orphan wells that the state is overseeing and managing for, exp for conducting experiments, right? Or is that an absolute no-go? You know, so we, we need to constrain, you know, the, um, options for for actually testing some of you know how much biochar can be put in to these wells how much can can we can we set up tests where we add biochar to to cement or is that a no-go because of legal i mean we have a whole legal section in this report assessment report that basically and holly can probably better summarize this than me but it basically says that anything that is not currently being used as a part of well blocking, you know, is not considered um, a material that you can just get permission to use. So we need, you you would need special permissions to add biochar to cement if you're going to plug wells uh, in the future. And so what 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 is possible within a, in a within a state funded program, right? Um, what are the risks? What are the considerations that we need to take? In? And I think we need to talk about that before we design a pilot, right? A pilot scale experiment, because you know that would be determining 
what we can do and what we cannot do. So that's super, super important. And, and, and we should probably do that. We should probably have a meeting early July, I would say. Yeah. So um, from the perspective of, you know, what, what is the, are there possible options for working with the orphan well program and orphan wells? I think Dave is the best expert. Unfortunately, he's right here to exactly. include in that conversation. I guess the other question to ask ourselves, and Mike, maybe you might have a sense of whether or not operators would be interested in requesting a variance from ECMC to use any of their wells um, to experiment with biochar in the plugging. I think the hesitancy, if, and Mike, I don't want to speak for you or, or oil and gas operators is going to be using something that's untested and, you know, wanting to know with cert with high certainty that I've done something the right way and it's not going to leak or have a problem later on because you want, you want to be able to say to ECMC, I've, I've, completed this and it's it's done and it's and it's meets the the requirements that the the state has for plugging a well. So fortunately you have two really smart people here on the working group I think that can give you some input as to like what possibilities exist and potential limitations or things that we might have to think about and address as part of a pilot. So Dave and Mike if you I can start I mean, in the 18 plus years I've been with the commission, that's how it always works. Um, any new material, any new process, uh, the vendor will go to the oil and gas companies first to, you know, sell their product, convince them that it's beneficial. Usually that's from an economic standpoint and complies with the rules. So normally operators will approach, um, not my staff, but engineering unit staff. Uh, to sell that idea and gain approval uh, to use something new. Um, from the orphan well program's perspective, um, you know, we, we have to satisfy that hurdle. We have to get approval from the engineering unit to use anything that's not normally used for plugging. Um, in that respect, we have to operate similar to what an operator would do um, as far as seeking approval. Secondly, we have to have a surface owner that is willing to have an experiment done on their property with ongoing monitoring and testing. Um, and how long will that last? I don't know until we talk about the pilot study. Um, so to me, those are the two biggest hurdles. So then Dave, it seems to me that if the recommendation is to create um uh, a des to design a pilot, we would want to include someone from engineering from ECMC so that there could be some clarity around what yeah, engineering I mean, we I've, want to see or have confidence in. Right. I do not have authority to make that decision. Okay. So we can, we can, we can talk Thomas internally who from ECMC could join the group and work if that's going to be the recommendation. And sorry, Mike, I saw that you unmuted. Oh, I was just going to say, Commissioner, that you kicked it off very well by saying that an operator would want to know exactly what's going in the well to, you know, say, yes, that if we plug this well with this material that we can walk away from it, that we're going to yeah, have our form 6SR and we're done and, you know, here you go. So uh, you, you've you've uh, let it off very well. But I did want to ask a quick question. I, I would assume, and, and based on all the great work that everyone's done, that we would say, yes, that we're likely going to go forward with the pilot. But I just want to know, based on how I read it, it says, if the group determines, will we have some guidelines from the summary to say, you know, this is the carbon footprint, this is the strength of the cement, this is something else, a matrix to say, yes, this is why we would recommend a pilot. These, these are the things that that we would see that, as it says in the legislation, that we have a positive impact on the health safety um, are, are, would we be able to evaluate it like that? Or, or I don't know, from the conversation of the group, it sounds like it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to go into a pilot recommendation. Molly? Um, yes, so you will have an opportunity to review all of our experimental data, the techno-economic analysis, our literature review. We're summarizing all of that, and we will have a number of summary statements throughout it, and then like a, a large summary at the end that <clears throat> based on all of our combined results, what we think um, 
Yeah, so exactly. And so what I, I've asked the team to do is develop a report that basically starts out with as an, an abstract that in layman's term describes the findings of, for example, the legal section or the mechanical strength section or the how much biochar we can put in between the, the cement plots, right? And then after that, we will have a more technical description where we go a little deeper. We might lose a little bit of the audience here, but that's for people like yourself and others who can understand the technical details. And then following the more in-depth explanation and summary, we will try to the extent we, um, <laughs> we feel comfortable, make some conclusions and describe the potential implications of these conclusions. An implication could be related to human health risk. It could be related to failure, maybe of, of, of the cement, right? If we go beyond 3%, we think there's a high risk of failure, even though we don't know, right? You would have to do the experiment. And we'll be very conservative, of course, right? And then we will have it, you know, Dave has you know, brought up economics. Um, and, and that's what, what, what Jason and Brooke are working on, the economic side of this. And I think that's a tough one, right? Because there's two, there's two very important aspects to this project. Economics, sure, that, that's important, but there's also the you know, capturing greenhouse gases, right? Reduction in the carbon footprint, how do you put, and maybe Brooke can actually answer this bit of, better than me, but you know, what is the price you want to set on, on, on limiting greenhouse gas emissions, for example? Um, I don't know. Jason, Brooke, maybe you're better. At, you see, I'm saying it might not be cheaper. I don't think it'd be cheaper to produce cement with 3% biochar. Yeah, it depends on what the value of carbon is. Is the value of carbon $5 a ton or is it $250 a ton? Right now, it's closer to the former than the latter. And then, I think more importantly, Brooke, you can talk to, we can include this, right? It's just the impact of that value of carbon that Thomas is talking about, right? And so to me right now at $50 a ton, it's not gonna have a huge impact. Is that is that a fair statement, Brooke? Uh, yeah. I, I just wanna say that, that the uh, current price for biochar related removals is about $150 per ton. And when you convert that back into biochar, it's two to three times that much. So that can make your biochar free almost in certain situations. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't really cost too much more in terms of the biochar. Yeah, in my initial calculations, I did it at $80 per ton. And using that credit, it was about 50% lower of cost for purchasing the biochar if you include the credit. So what you said about 150 would basically pay for the cost of biochar does seem on track. But I do agree that there's value in um, including the different um, values that could happen as the credit for carbon changes. Uh, Thomas, thank you so much for explaining how the document's gonna look. Um, whether it's apparent on how you set up the document or the summary to all the participants, or potentially we would have some other sort of matrix to say, as we're reading through this, you know, here is, is a, a matrix to satisfy, you know, have, have we had a positive impact on the health, safety, welfare of the state, long-term, short-term greenhouse gas uh, reduction goals. Um, I, I think that, really embodies what's in the legislation and, and would give the participants an easier way to say, yes, let's go forward with the pilot or, hey, he, here's some things. I, I'm not going to predetermine how it looks, but um, I just want to make sure that when when the participants get the document, it makes sense that this document is helping us make the next decision. Thank you. No, absolutely. And that's and I just met the Holly about that uh, on how to best structure it and be open. Hey, if you if any of of the panelists here or advisory board members have any suggestions to how they think we 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 can best possibly you know format the document, um, please let us know. Just email me and Holly um, with the input. Maybe maybe a good idea would be to have like um, a table with like 
go no go decision points right now we don't have so what would be a go for example let's say with a, with, a, with a additional biochar would it be a go if it was one percent would it be a go if it's three percent biochar you know um we definitely know when it's a no-go. I mean, when we see really, really poor performance above 3%, my team would say, let's not, let's not mess with, with anything higher than whatever it might be, 3% or something like that. Um, so, 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 so yeah, normally in big DOE grants, the way DOE evaluate these type of things from the perspective of continuing funding would be, hey, did you meet the goal? You know, um, is it, did your experiment show that we should absolutely not try this any further because there was no promising results? Um, and I think it also comes back to, you know, what, what can we test? You know, what can we test in, in a pilot in the future? What are options? Can, I mean, the state owns a lot of wells, right? Um, is, that a, is that a free for all? If the state owns the wells, can we go in and, with the support of the state, you know, pick a few wells and, and set up experiments with so, Dave and his team. Thomas, or... I just want to clarify, while the state owns the well, it's still on somebody's property, not the state's we, property. And so state is... we have the responsibility for the well, but we don't. Okay. Like it's not That's... in our name or anything. We are That's... responsible for plugging it. The state does not own the well, nor do we own any equipment that is attached to the well. And I'll just add real quick, um, Thomas, if we can lean on the academic worlds uh, or, or, or um, like you said, your your um, work with DOE type things, um, lean on that experience to say, okay, th these are the things that get you to the next step. Um, I think that would then, whether it's, you know, Dave with an orphan well or an operator with one of their own wells to say, okay, even before we get to whose well we're going to try this on here are some things where we would say, hey, this part of it was great. We we have a very low carbon footprint. You know, this part was great that the, the uh, cement was stronger or or no, this part was not because of this. Like if you can lay that out very succinctly for folks and, and I, I want to, like you said, send out a draft, you know, it's not a us versus them, like send out the draft, let us, let us help you um, formulate it and, and craft it so we can make sure that message is apparent. So um Thank Absolutely. you for letting me add that. Yeah, I know that that that's that's totally aligned with what I hope to do with this report. So thank you. Um, and, and you all have a you all have a month to provide feedback, right? In the month of June, everybody can go in and rip it apart, and then you know we will take all the suggestions and and comments into consideration as we finalize the the document by the end of the month. That's my understanding. And then, yes, we, we maybe have a Rubik's in the end uh, schedule, uh, you know, table, right? Like some, some type of Rubik's where we kind of very clearly, based on each task, we have developed a report. The, the report will be developed into the task if you are assigned, right? Um, and we'll address every single task one by one in each their own separate chapter. And then we can summarize all of that in a table and then we can conclude based on each task, whether we should continue uh, additional experimentation or not, based on our either literature review or lab studies. Um, and so, yeah, anyways, and I do think actually, I mean, we, we are being contacted a lot, honestly, after this project, you know, in public, right? it's a public project. I'm telling you, a lot of people wants to be involved, um, especially all the biochar producers from, from all over the place, including New York. And I mean, everybody is trying to figure out how to be involved. And I think that's a part of designing a pilot. It is actually to get people involved. We'll select people that we think can help um, this effort. And I know Carrie and my team, you know, we are talking to people who are doing, who are blocking wells, right? And so that might be some interest from some of those companies that are doing well plucking and we do need to work with professionals. I mean, <laughs> my team cannot do well plucking. It is a very in intricate you know, process. It's very, very difficult. You need a lot of experience. So we need to work with professionals. And so we need to have 
professionals included in this process, uh, the design process. And so you, Mike, or Dave, you know, have suggestions to who we need to, to work with, please let us know. I also think that I, I do know personally a lot of people who own wells and own the land and that I'm 95% sure that they would they would be very interested in actually working with us. Um, so so, I, so I, have, I have I have some good contacts and as soon as the board here says, yeah, please reach out, um, I'll do it. I haven't done that yet. So so I think, you know, but the risk assessment, I don't know, Dave, that's his, you know, um, you know, what are the risks? I, I, I don't know how to assess risk of, 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 of trying to use cement with biochar, for example. I don't know the risk of putting, you know, replacing the mud with biochar in these wells. I mean, how to as truly assess the risk, you know, um, that's something we need help with too. We can do a lot of modeling and so forth and so on, um, but we certainly need people who understand how to evaluate risk if we are going to supplement some of the mods with biochar output, you know, do, so, so any, so, any, any contacts in that arena, please forward to me, or uh, connect us. So with, with regard to the use of biochar and cement, I think you're, you know, you're addressing that through the testing. Um, as far as using it in the spacer, the primary concern is density. Um, so our rules require either the weight of water, 8.3 pounds per gallon, um, or a minimum of nine pounds per gallon if you're weighting up to control the formation. So with a less dense biochar being added to water or water-based mud, you're lower, lowering density. So, I mean, that's our primary concern there. But does that mean it's a, a no-go? I mean, you will change the density, that's exactly. Well, I mean, you would have, have to put other additives in to weight it back up. And I would just note that there are a, a wide variety of densities and different types of biochars. So one thing you might want to consider there is a sewage sludge biochar. One, because it'll be very cheap, but two, it's heavier. And that's why golf courses like to use it because, you know, it's it's easier to spread than this really lightweight, fluffy stuff. So I, that's a, yeah, I actually have a few projects with municipal uh sludge that you're turning into biochar and that's exactly it is like it is nearly like cement <laughs> you can kill people with that right yeah. and actually that might if you're going that route that might actually address another big concern of the state uh and that's pfas and so the reason we have several projects related to turning biosolids into biochar is because we are hoping to actually eliminate these forever chemicals called PFAS, you know, and that's that's a huge concern. And I, yeah, anyway, so, so we might be actually solving two problems by yeah, considering I, that. There's a bunch of people focusing on that whole PFAS thing. So I can, I can connect you if you're interested later. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to jump back to ownership for, for a minute. Um, what I meant was ECMC does not own anything. We don't own wells. We don't own equipment. We don't own wellheads or flow lines. Um, state land board has an ownership interest, either surface or minerals in some wells, but that's a fairly small portion of our inventory. Okay. So, I mean, other, otherwise we would be working with private surface owners. Okay. Would it be a good idea if I start to reach out to companies and owners of wells and say, hey, maybe we will be doing something? <laughs> you know, and, and that's the other question. If you're going to, so we're going to design a pilot for the next half year when we're done with this. But then if you're actually going to conduct pilot experiments, how would that be funded? Right. One thing is to design. We can design a great experiment, but as there's no funding lined up um, to actually conduct these experiments, then it's kind of meaningless. 
I know that there's certainly probably a lot of stakeholders out there that will be interested in, in going in and helping out. I mean, including, you know, anything from manufacturers of biochar to people who do uh, parking of oil and gas wells that we potentially get on the team that would be interested in sponsoring something like that. Um, there are foundations out there too, potentially that would be interested in investing in developing new strategies, but then of course they want to have some ownership. I think then we're talking about developing new IP, right? Intellectual property. And when you develop new, you know, intellectual property, people who would invest in, in, in the development would probably want, you know, some, um, um, yeah, some first rights to the, to the li to licensing certain things. Um, and I know people are interested in that. So I'm not just saying it. I know there are people who are very interested in the potential for setting up companies to actually go out and plug wells in, in a new way in the future. Uh, but they definitely want to have the rights to some of the IP because else there's nothing in it for them and royalties and and all of that stuff. Um, and so when we do that, you know, we need to get CSU involved and all of their legal team because CSU, if they develop new technology, they also want a piece of the pie and, and things becomes complicated, but not impossible. Thomas, did you all look at any of the legislation that passed at the federal level in the past couple of years that um, was set aside for plugging and abandonment and um, some oil and gas activities and whether a pilot would be eligible for that funding at all. Did you look into that, Holly, a little bit after we talked? Um, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, do you, like, is there, maybe you could email me specifically, like, what you're referring to after this okay. meeting and I can check with, um, Dave, what was the name of the act that gave each of the states funding to plug wells as well as the BLM? I think it's the BLM got funding as well. Um, so for IIJA, it relies on the state rules and what's allowed by the state as far as what's required for plugging. Um, for the BLM um, portion of it, that would have to comply with um, one of the BLM entry orders for plugging. I don't know. There's a bunch of BLM people on here. They might be able to answer that better than I. And I'm trying to remember the name of their, I think, I want to say there's two different bills that provided federal funding, but I can't remember the names, the titles of the bills. And so this is not helpful for me. Sorry. Um, so the, the other one would be um, Inflation Reduction Act, but that was not for orphaned wells. Oh, okay. I hear somebody. It's Kimba with BLM. Um, yeah. Just like what he was saying, it's the Bipartisan Inflation Reduction Act and the IRA, the, inf the inf um, which is the other one. Um, so which kind of gave money to states, tribes and BLM. Um, so there is money and we do have contract um, opportunities for education that they can get money to do research um, under that act, um, but the money is dwindling down. So if you do, if you do have projects, I would do it sooner rather than later. Kemba, are you a per good person for Thomas to connect with later on if he just wants some more details on where to go or Holly, like where to dig into your um, process and where funding streams are available? Um, yes, he can contact me. And if I'm not the good point of contact, I can get someone at our headquarters level. Thanks, Kemba. I appreciate that. Jen has had a question. And the question was whether there's less carbon in biochar derived from biosolids compared to woody biomass. And I think that is in general, in general, true. You know, there's a little less carbon, but it is bios biosolids are, you know human, you know, fecal material. So obviously there's a ton of carbon in there, um, but it does have less than woody, woody biomass. Um, and then there's also other things. I mean, that's the thing. It's not only PFAS, there's, there's metals in there. The ash composition is very different. Um, 
there's a lot of talk about how to manage municipal solids right now because we are running out of landfills in the world, not only in the US, but the whole world, we are running out of space for landfills. We are, you know, the, the, you can incinerate, but there's a humongous carbon footprint related to incineration of, of, of biosolids. Half of all biosolids are being land applied in the United States right now. But with the threat of all these personal care products and emerging contaminants such as PFAS and other things, there's a lot of concern amongst the public with respect to land application of biosolids. Um, and so that's all. DOE has funded, you know, research looking into pyrolysis of um, biosolids, especially from the perspective of getting rid of PFAS and other, you know, antimicrobials and so forth and so on. Because then you could potentially also land apply the biochar afterwards. And we are then adding another thing you could do with a biochar. You can maybe also store it in these orphan wells. Um, so yeah, maybe a little less carbon, but you might be taking care of a lot of other issues at the same time. Looks like Mike was gonna have, has his hand up, but I was just gonna add in, um, that might require some other permitting through CDPHE for solid waste or other issues. Uh, just one other question. I know you talked about, um, I think it was Carrie, you were saying something about how with the different amount of biochar, your strength increase. Will you have a component in the report that's also Young's modulus? I'm curious, as the strength increases, if the Young's also increases, um, brittle cement is is not always better. Um, not, I don't want to try to go into a problem solving session on that right now, but if you have that in the report, that would be really good. Yeah. So I don't have, I, so the, the, the graphs that I'm generating are not stress strain. They're like stress time is what the, the machine gives us. Um, but like I did do like the materials analysis and I consulted with like my materials professor and also the the concrete professor here and like they're analyzed pretty similar. So like that is something I do see is like there is way more like plastic deformation the more biochar you have versus like when it's just a control with no biochar there's it's, it's like just completely elastic just shatters but that's partially why i said the five percent mix didn't work <laughs> is it doesn't fracture at all it just squishes like a sponge which obviously isn't ideal so i do have that analysis in there i don't know if i can i i can see if i can calculate like precise young's modulus for each one um but i will have information about like how it's fracturing and like the materials analysis of that. that that'd be awesome looking looking forward to the report thank you are there any other questions from folks because i want to be cognizant of everyone's time um i also want to check the temperature of folks and um csu when our next meeting should be so if the the draft is due june 1st and then by August, I'm trying to try, I'm trying to read off my little tiny phone, the bill again, and all the due dates, and it's it's a little difficult. Um, this group has to decide whether or not we want to recommend that the phase two kick in and we draft some sort of what would, what would a pilot study look like, right? So I'm working our way backwards. When do folks want or need to see things? Is our expectation that the if we meet on June first, I don't even know what day of the week that is, so I have to look and see. Um, you want to see the draft ahead of time, how how much ahead of time, or is it just due June first and then we meet after June first as a group when we've had time to read it, absorb it, and then ask questions or ask for revisions or more information or what have you. I'm trying to get a temperature of the group here and what the expectations are. That, that's at least our uh, working model. Which we one, have, Thomas? We will have a um, finalized draft that we can share with the entire group 1st of June. That's the that's the deadline we're working. Okay. Um, well, and then we think the group should have some time maybe two weeks or 
however long you need um, to evaluate the draft. And then we should meet immediately after. Well, then we should have a chance to read maybe some of the feedback if it's written um, to see if we can incorporate it and also how we can best address it. So, <laughs> and that would also take time to incorporate, right? So if we, if we have to have a final, final, final <laughs> report by 1st of July, and I don't know how, 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 how hard these deadlines are, we would have to work really hard. Um, and so maybe a week to evaluate and then we meet a week later, that's mid June, and then we can incorporate, you know, changes the following two weeks. Um, I don't know, something like that. So my question to the group is if CSU has a draft that will get submitted by on June 1st, which is a Sunday, so probably let's say June 2nd, um, Janice, what'd you say? It's actually a Saturday. I was wrong. Oh, it's a Saturday. So uh -huh. June 3rd, that would be a Monday. If people have a week to read it and we meet on the 10th. Thanks, Dave. What, how do folks feel about it? Is a week enough to read? I don't know how big and dense this is going to be, Holly. <laughs> It'll be about it's going to be a long document, pages. but yeah. as we discussed, we're going to try to have some very clear locations where you can look if you just want the general answer of what we think is best. You know, we'll we'll specify where our recommendations are for you to navigate through that easier. But it, it will be a pretty lengthy document. And um, would you like folks as they're reading the so I'm going to put June 10th would be our next June June 3rd. We'll, everyone will get a copy. June 10th, we will meet. In between June 3rd and June 10th, if people have questions or something doesn't make sense or they want clarification, you want those questions ahead of time so you're not trying to answer them on the fly on June 10th, or do you envision June 10th is when everybody brings their questions and then we have a successive meeting where you all have time to think about how to answer them? I think similar yeah. to uh, the earlier report, as you read through it, you can put comments on the document and send those over to us or any questions. Um, you can also just bring them um, that meeting, but having them before only helps us better prepare. Yeah, then we, then we can prepare better answers instead of having to answer things on, 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 the, on our feet. Um, so I think as soon as people have comments and feedback, you know, send it to us. If it can be directly associated with a PDF that you um, will receive, that would be great. If you know how to use the common function in PDF, right? So we know exactly the line and page and you just put in a comment say, hey, I don't understand that or clarify that, or is that number really correctly? Or you should use Kathleen's number and not this number. And that's, that's the other thing, I mean, uh, Brooke, now we heard some, we heard like three different pricing <laughs> models for biochar. And um, I don't know, maybe maybe that's an easy way to say, hey, this is the best case scenario and this is the worst case scenario. This is, a, this is an $80 a ton and this is Kathleen's, you know, she was talking about <laughs> some pretty high numbers. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. We'll see you next time. So I I do think based on feedback, Thomas and Holly, um, there's a desire, at least from a few folks in the group to have some sort of decision making matrix where we lay out, um, things that we should consider in our decision to recommend drafting a phase, a pilot phase. Absolutely. Um, and so if you all could think about that as you're working on your draft, that would be great. That was the biggest takeaway I got, I guess, from like what folks are hoping to see as part of the the um, the draft. And then Holly or Thomas or whomever, it sounded to me like Kemba was very open to connecting with you all to talk about potential funding opportunities at the federal level. Super. Okay. Is there any anything else from the group? Am I missing anything? Otherwise yeah, I just saw this question from Janice. So yes, we're going to try to include like a plain language summary in every section and like what our recommendation is based off of that. Those of us who are not very technical appreciate that. 
but um, but but and, and I think the legislature will appreciate that, right? That I mean, most folks aren't don't have expertise in this, and so providing plain language about what we found and and what the results were and the recommendations is super helpful. Yeah. So and that was that was what I told Polly the other day. And so does it make sense that we basically start out each chapter, each chapter being titled with the title of the task, and then we basically start with kind of a layman's term written abstract that mm -hmm. kind of summarizes everything and then you go into details because it's not like you don't want the details you want i mean people yeah, like you want to back up what you gave and more concluded. technical folks yeah. you still want the hard sure. data right yeah for sure i okay. think that sounds good and janice says thumbs up as well okay okay good really and trying to honor people's time uh i think i'll I know lunch hour sucks, but it just seems to be open for everybody. So I'm going to go for June 10th from like noon to 1.30 since we're going to be going through a document and it might be pretty dense and heavy. Or do people want two hours, hour and so a half? I will be in Europe. I'll be working at University of Vienna. Um, that sounds really rough, Thomas. It's really rough. It's in the Alps. You know, it's all these big mountains I have to get over um, on my bicycle. No, so um, what's the time you know, difference? I'll be, eight, I'll be eight hours ahead of you guys, and so it's better if you have a morning morning meeting for me. Then it'll be, you know, late afternoon okay. for me. So, so for those, does that work then for Kathleen also? Because she's on New York time. So if we move it up, that still works for her as well. So if I try yeah. to do like a a ten to noon, Thomas. That's still the evening for you. 10 to noon would be yeah, from 6 to 8. That's fine. Okay. Folks okay with that? Okay, great. And for those of you not getting the invite, I don't, I don't, I am sending to you. You're on my list. I don't know why you're not getting it. I apologize. Thomas, you and Janice seem to be on like some weird I don't know, ghost list where you're not getting the info that you need. And so I apologize, but you are on my invite list. You're in there and um, I don't know what's happening. Okay. Anything else for the good of the cause? No, I'm just, I'm just encouraging everybody here to forward connections that we need to reach out to. If we move forward with, you know, having to design a pilot, I don't think it's too early because we will have very little time, right? So whether it's industries or wealth blockers or, landowners or biochar manufacturers you name it just start to you know at least uh, let's let's get that list together and then jason and i will contact me take you know and, and see if there's opportunities for us to work with them uh but but yeah we it'll be tight you know six months this was tight to right october to now <laughs> all the stuff we've been doing um but anyways Great. Sounds like you guys are making great progress though. So that's, that's good to hear. All right, everybody have a great week and we'll see you June 10th. Yes. Okay. Talk to Thank everyone you. soon. Bye. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye.